The goals of chapter six are understand the concept of energy, know the difference between heat and work, know about the system and surroundings and how heat and work influence both of them, know how to compute the standard enthalpy of formation, delta HF, for a chemical reaction, and know how to do Hess's law problems. So one of the main focuses of this lecture has to do with the interaction of the system with the surroundings or the surroundings with the system. So take a look at scenario one here that's on the left. We have gas molecules that have expanded. And when the gas molecules expand, it raises this piston up. As a result, we have an increase in volume. So in scenario one, we can say work done by the system, which includes, and the surroundings is basically everything around it. It could be the room, or in some cases, it could even just be the universe. When a system such as this does work, here we have gas molecules that have expanded. So it's really doing pressure volume work. As a result of these gases expanding, you have an increase in volume and the piston rises up. So here you have work done by the system on the surroundings. As a result, the work function for the system takes a negative value, and the work function for the surroundings, everything outside the system, takes on a positive value, an equal and opposite value. In scenario two, let's look at the, what happens when we go from right to left in this figure. So here, the surroundings will push on um, this piston, causing a decrease in volume. When that happens, the surroundings is doing work on the system. So we say in scenario two, work done by the surroundings on the system. The work function for the surroundings is negative, and the work function for the system is positive, of an equal and opposite value. We can also look at energy transformation. That has to do with this term called enthalpy, delta H. So if heat, which is a form of energy, escapes from the system, which is really our reaction center, and goes to the surroundings, we call that an exothermic reaction. In other words, heat is evolved to the surroundings. In that particular scenario, the enthalpy for the system is negative. It has a negative value. And the enthalpy of the surroundings is positive. It has a positive value. So from the standpoint of the surroundings, it's endothermic. From the standpoint of the system, it's exothermic. If surroundings release heat into the system, you have a scenario in which the surroundings become exothermic from its perspective, and the delta H of its value, its enthalpy value, will be negative. From the perspective of the system, the reaction center, it is endothermic. The enthalpy will have a positive value, and it will be endothermic. So the interactions between the system and surroundings in terms of work being done by something on the other, as well as heat flow, whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic, is a very important theme that is in this chapter. As we begin our lecture on chapter six, as we begin our lecture on chapter six, don't forget the homework problems that are available for you for practice. So chapter six deals with thermochemistry and thermo literally means heat. So it is an aspect of chemistry that involves heat transfer, heat flow. Uh, but before we talk about heat in any sense of the word, we have to talk about energy. So energy is the capacity to do work and work is generally good energy. Work is energy that can be manifested to perform radiant energy, thermal energy, chemical energy, such as ATP, potential energy, and kinetic energy. There's many, many different types of energies, also gravitational energy, mechanical energy, nuclear energy, and the list goes on and on. So work is useful energy. It is energy that can be harvested. We will contrast that with heat, which is energy that tends to dissipate. So energy that goes away, or sometimes it can come in, especially when you're talking about the system and the surroundings. Always keep in mind the law of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created and energy cannot be destroyed. So there must be an accountability of all aspects of energy. And in some chemical reactions, some of the energy can 
be released as heat. Sometimes heat can come into the reaction to facilitate the reaction in moving from reactants to products. So that is a main focal point of this chapter. Just as a reminder, heat travels from hot to cold, and usually heat is a transfer of thermal energy. So when we're talking about thermal chemistry or thermochemistry, we are really talking about the transfer of heat. Now comes an interesting aspect of studying thermochemistry, is that we divide what we are studying into two parts. We divide it into the system and we divide it into the surroundings. So I like to define the system as basically what we're dealing with, what we are talking about. It could be the reaction flask, it could be the test tube beaker, it could be anything where the reaction takes place. We contrast that with the surroundings. The surroundings is everything outside of the system. That can include the room, that can include the town, that can include the city. Really, it can encompass the entire universe. Different type of systems are shown in this figure. Here we have an open system with open communication with this flask and the surroundings. Notice heat can come in and out. Again, thermochemistry, the transfer or heat flow. And so we have an open communication with the surroundings of the system. So mass and energy can be exchanged. A lot of times if this was just water, the water can evaporate. Contrast that with the second column, which is a closed system. In a closed system, there really is no communication with the surroundings. However, energy in the form of heat can come in and out of this flask. So heat can come in and warm the contents of this water or whatever is inside here, or heat can come out of the contents of this flask, whether it's water or anything else. So energy in the form of heat can be exchanged. And third, we have an adiabatic chamber. This is where the system is completely isolated from the surroundings. In such a case, heat cannot be transferred and a mass cannot be transferred as well. So this is a situation where pressure, temperature, everything is just completely isolated. The system can have nothing to do with the surroundings. One of the main themes of this chapter is processes that are endothermic versus processes that are exothermic. If we take a look at this reaction here, shown is two moles of hydrogen gas plus one mole of oxygen gas reacting to form two moles of water, and the state is a liquid state. Also, that what is being evolved is energy. So this is what is known as an exothermic reaction. Coming back to our system and surroundings, demarcation, energy is released from the system to the surroundings in this specific reaction, so we call that an exothermic reaction. This is a term that's very important to realize, exothermicity versus endothermicity. <clears throat> we also say that this delta H term, which is known as enthalpy, is negative for an exothermic reaction. Enthalpy is our unit of measurement for heat flow. We will contrast an exothermic reaction with an endothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction is a reaction that requires heat from the surroundings to the system. So in other words, it is an opposite of an exothermic reaction. An exothermic reaction releases heat. An endothermic reaction requires heat in order to facilitate the reactants being transformed to products. This delta H term, which is known as enthalpy, is positive for an endothermic reaction. Here is an example of an endothermic reaction. An important point to realize is that energy in an endothermic reaction is in the reactant side. Energy in an exothermic reaction is in the product side. It is released in an exothermic reaction to the surroundings. On the flip side, energy is taken in from the surroundings to the system in an endothermic reaction. Energy, temperature, pressure, volume are known as state functions. 
State functions are mechanistic independent. So we do not care how we get from reactants to products. We can go there in many different routes or many different types of mechanisms in terms of the molecules. What we are, what we are concerned with is the products and what we are concerned with is the final temperature, the final pressure, the final volume, the final enthalpy. We are concerned with the final value. We're not concerned with how it got there. Mechanistically, a state function is independent. We are not concerned with how reactants get transformed to products. In other systems, particularly in organic chemistry, there is a whole section dedicated to mechanism. That is how a reactant goes to a product. Here, if we quote a temperature, if we quote a pressure, or if we quote an energy, we don't know how it got there. We only, only, only are concerned with the value. Another term that's used a, a lot is U. U is sort of this term for universe. And it's not really important that you get the variables correct, but you should probably know this equation is also standard in many chemistry textbooks. The energy or the internal energy of the system plus the internal energy of the surroundings must equal zero. This is a quantitative explanation for the law of conservation of energy. This delta symbol actually means change in. So anytime you see delta, think final minus initial. Final state of the system minus the initial state of the system. Final state of the surroundings minus the initial state of the surroundings. So delta is another word for final minus initial. It is a subtraction. It is a change in. Our system has two things that go with it or against it. One of them is work, which is symbolized by W. And another thing that goes into or out of the system is Q. Q is a terminology for heat. Q, lowercase q, means heat. The unit of heat is usually joules, but we can also have kilojoules. And a lot of textbooks also quote the calorie. But in this particular chapter and in the course, uh, Chemistry 101, we will use Q, lowercase, as a symbol of heat. But more importantly, we will utilize the units of joule. A very, port a very important distinction occurs when we're talking about signage, pluses or minuses. So work done by the system on the surroundings means that the sign of the system is negative. But the sign of the surroundings is going to be equal and opposite but positive. The work done on the system by the surroundings, the sign for the system is positive, but the sign for the system is an equal and opposite negative. In this second situation, the surroundings are doing work on the system. So if you're doing work on something, you become negative. Heat absorbed by the system from the surroundings, that is an endothermic process as described previously and heat absorbed by the surroundings from the system as an exothermic process, that is negative. Now just realize that the opposite for an ex endothermic process, if we switch it, we become exothermic. And also for an exothermic process, if we flip it or we switch it or reverse the process, that becomes now endothermic. This is a very important point. An endothermic process in one direction becomes exothermic in the other direction. An exothermic process in one direction becomes endothermic in the opposite direction. In other words, if we reverse a reaction, we flip the sign of delta H or the enthalpy. Gases also perform work, but we say gases perform pressure volume work. Shown here is a piston, and this is the initial state. The final state, the gases have actually expanded. So work has been done on the system around the surroundings. So the work function for the gases is actually negative. The work function for the surroundings is actually positive. You can see here the expansion of the gas causes an increase in volume, but a decrease in pressure. The gases have done work, but we also call it pressure volume work because the only work that gases can do is exert a pressure. It can exert a pressure up or down. Here, the pressure has decreased. The volume has increased by this amount, delta V. It has pushed this piston up. The surroundings, which is the universe, has, can't do anything. The surroundings just are stuck with the fact that this piston has pushed up against it.
let's do this practice problem. A gas expands and does pressure volume work on the surroundings equal to 279 joules. At the same time, it absorbs 216 joules of heat from the surroundings. What is the change in energy of the system? For the answer to this problem, we must utilize the equation. The change in the internal energy of the universe is Q plus W. Q is heat, W is work. Now Q is heat. This tells us that it absorbs 216 kilojoules of heat from the surround. It's an absorption. The surroundings have given that heat to the system. The system has taken those 216 joules, so that value is positive. It does pressure volume work on the surroundings. So here the gas system does work on the surroundings. That's 279 joules worth of energy. So if it's doing it on the surroundings, then it's negative. So the change in energy of the universe, or excuse me, the change in energy of the system, the change in energy of the system is minus 63 joules. The change in energy of the surroundings is 63 joules positive. Remember, systems plus surroundings, the change in energy must be equal to zero. That is the law of conservation of energy. Now we discuss an important part of this chapter, enthalpy. Enthalpy has the designation of delta H. So that delta is important. We don't measure H, but we measure delta H, which means a change in enthalpy. And what is, de and what is delta? So delta is final minus initial. So really what we're talking about is the final state, the final energy state, minus the initial energy state. The final energy state for a chemical reaction is the products, and the initial energy state for a chemical reaction is the reactants. So from there, we get the delta H, which is products minus the reactant. This gives us the exothermic versus endothermic status of a particular chemical reaction. This flow chart is the same that is seen above. The difference is that if you look here, the products are actually at a higher reaction than the reactants. And here, the pro reactants are at a higher status, energetically speaking, than the products. So this is what we would call an exothermic reaction. This is an error in the textbook. And this is what we will call an endothermic reaction. An endothermic reaction is positive. An exothermic reaction is negative. This is an error in the textbook. <laughs> the units of enthalpy is kilojoules per mole. Sometimes it is joules per mole. Again, look at that per mole. So really, it's energy per amount of substance. Mole is the SI unit for the amount of substance. So let's take a look here. For a reaction that involves the combustion of CH4, with met which is methane, we have carbon dioxide and two molecules of water that are released. The delta H for this reaction that has computed under specific conditions, usually temperature and pressure, it will be minus 890.4 kilojoules per mole. The minus sign should immediately tip you off that this is an exothermic reaction and energy is released, energy is released from the system to the surroundings. We can derive a number of relationships. For every one mole of CH4, there's this many kilojoules. For every two moles of O2, there's this many kilojoules. And for every one mole of CO2, there's this many kilojoules from the delta H shown above. And for every two moles of H2O, there's this many kilojoules minus 890.4. Again, the equation is balanced. And because of the balanced chemical equation, we can develop these relationships. Now let's compare this with a second reaction. This is the combustion of methane. But the difference is that Yes, it is still balanced, but we're producing two moles of H2O gas. Now contrast this above where we produce two moles of H2O water. So going from a gas to a um, liquid or going from a liquid to a gas, you can see that the enthalpy change is dramatically different. The minus sign should immediately tip you off that this is still an exothermic reaction, same as above. However, it's minus 802.4. It is not the same. So this is about 90 kilojoules less. And so the bottom line is that states matter. The gaseous state of water has a different enthalpy of formation than the liquid state of water 
which has a different enthalpy of formation. That is a term that I just uh, stated, which is a very important th term, and it is worth dedicating some time to. So standard state of formation, this is something that you should know. And basically what you should know is this symbiology here, or this uh, type of symbol. Delta H, we have an O, which is a superscript, and we have an F, which is a subscript. The F stands for formation, and the O stands for standard state. This is also called delta H naught of F. That O is sometimes called naught, but that just implies a standard state. Standard state is a specific set of conditions, and usually those conditions are one atmosphere of pressure and 25 degrees C. Very important to know. Now, when you have a reaction that's occurring under standard state conditions, 25 degrees C, one atmosphere of pressure, you can actually look up these values in the back of a book. And your chemistry textbook or the internet has uh, values that correspond to standard state of formation. F is formation. O is the formation of those chemicals at standard state conditions, one atmosphere of pressure, 25 degrees C. Again, we look these up in the back of a textbook. So this is state dependent. You saw previously that H2O gas and H2O liquid, they influence the enthalpy of the reaction. Some very important points with regards to the properties of enthalpy. This will become important when we talk about Hess's law. So one thing is if you reverse a reaction, we change the sign. So here we reversed reaction one, the combustion of methane. Now the reactants have become the products. The products have become the reactants, and the delta H has changed sign. So what was now an exothermic reaction shown above has now become an endothermic reaction by virtue of flipping the reactants and products. That's rule number one. Rule number two is that if you multiply this chemical equation by a number, so here we multiplied it by two to get two, four, two and four as the stoichiometric coefficients. So multiply an entire reaction by two, we multiply that corresponding enthalpy that we computed by two. If we multiply this reaction by three, we multiply this by three. If we multiply this reaction by one half, we multiply the enthalpy that we computed by one half. If we multiply this reaction by 500, we multiply the enthalpy by 500. So multiply a reaction you multiply the corresponding delta H. So here's a practice problem. Calculate the heat evolved when 266 grams of white phosphorus burns in air according to this equation. So shown is the balanced chemical equation. For those that have done this problem, we are given the chemical equation along with its enthalpy. The negative sign means that this releases energy. So you can also say energy is evolved, it's part of the products, and it releases minus 3,013 kilojoules per mole, per mole of P4, per five moles of, or excuse me, per mole of O2, though we have five moles of it, and per mole of P4O10, tetraphosphorus decaoxide. We don't have one mole of P4, we have 266 grams of P4, so we do our stoichiometry, and we're able to get that per mole of P4 white phosphorus, we release minus 6,468. Calorimetry is the next section in this chapter, and this involves heat, Q. So basically, we're looking at specific materials and their ability to absorb heat, and that's called specific heat or heat capacity. So two definitions here, specific heat and heat capacity. First, let's talk about specific heat. This is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree C. I want you to pay close attention to the units. Units is the amount of energy joules to raise one gram of a substance grams by one degree C. That is a constant for a given material. So copper, iron, gold, water, ethanol, they'll all have their own specific heat that you can look up in a textbook. Another terminology that involves heat is heat capacity, and it has constant C. And this is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree C. So again, I want you to emphasize the C, the amount of energy in joules required to weigh 
or raise one gram, the amount of energy in joules required to raise the temperature of a substance by one degree C. Here we have an equation that relates heat capacity with temperature, and that is Q equals C delta T. C is heat capacity, delta T is the change in temperature, final minus initial. We can also substitute this term with instead of heat capacity with S specific heat. And when we do that, we get this equation Q equals M sat. M as in mass, S the specific heat, delta T as in the change in temperature. Remember, Q is heat. Calori calorimetry has to do with heat changes or heat exchanges. Shown in this table here are different heat capacities of substances. Again, look at the units of specific heat, the amount of heat in joules required to raise one gram of a substance by one degree C. Water has really a high heat capacity, 4.184. So it takes a lot of heat in joules to raise one gram of water by one degree C. It's one of the, again, very, very quirky properties of water. Let's do this practice problem involving a heat exchange or calorimetry. So an iron bar of mass 869 grams, that's going to be your mass M, cools from 94 degrees to 5 degrees. So that's going to be your delta T, final minus initial. Calculate the heat released in kilojoules by the metal. The specific heat S of iron is going to be 0.444 joules per gram. So doing this problem, we use Q equals M S delta T. M is your mass, 869 grams. S is the specific heat of the iron bar, 0.444 joules per grams degree C. And then your delta T is the final temperature, which is five degrees, minus the initial temperature, which was 95, 94 degrees. Here I, it's 95 degrees, so it's an error in my math. So anyways, you should be able to get minus 34 or so kilojoules that is released. Now, the minus sign tells you that energy in the form of heat is released. Okay, remember Q is heat energy, and the negative sign tells you that it is released to the surroundings. Think about this when you read the problem. The iron bar has a mass. When it cools from this high temperature to this low temperature, where will the heat go from that iron bar? The heat from the iron bar will go to the surroundings. So yes, when you release from the system to the surroundings, you become negative, the surroundings become positive. Let's review standard enthalpy of formation, this symbol here. Delta is change in, H is enthalpy, F is formation, and O is standard state conditions. So for now, it's going to be one atmosphere and 25 degrees C. This is an equation that's important to know, the delta H of a reaction. Now, what does that O or not symbol tell you? The delta H of a reaction not means that this is under standard state, okay? It is the summation of the products, their enthalpy of formation, standard state minus the sum of the enthalpy standard state formation of the reactants, each multiplied by their stoichiometric coefficient. So many students in my past experience forget to multiply the delta HF standard state with the stoichiometric coefficient. So you must balance the equation. You must simply balance the equation. Where do you get the delta HF of standard state? You get it from the back of the book or you get it from an internet source. Let's do this problem here, which encompasses the computation of enthalpy. Benzene burns in air to produce carbon dioxide and liquid water. That's a combustion reaction. The chemical equation is shown here. Calculate the heat released in kilojoules per gram of the compound benzene that reacts with oxygen. The standard enthalpy of formation of benzene is 49.04 kilojoules per mole. So this is the delta H uh, F at standard state. Okay, so you have to really look at the word standard and it automatically think standard state conditions. So the standard enthalpy of formation of benzene is this value. And it's wanting the standard 
uh, enthalpy of the reaction under standard state conditions for this entire reaction. First things first, let's balance this equation. So this is the first step in me balancing it. I need 15 halves O2. I have to put a fraction in there to balance the oxygens. But don't worry, I can clear the fraction by multiplying both sides of the chemical equation by 2. So this is my balanced chemical equation. I'll use this formula here, the summation of the delta H of the products minus the summation of delta H of the reactants. Since this is in standard state, really what I should do is put an O here because this is the delta H formation in standard state. All right, now that I have corrected the equation so that it properly reflects, number one, that it is standard state, that is that where that not or O symbol comes in, and that these are standard state enthalpy of formation. So I can look at these in the back of a book. So now I'm already given the standard enthalpy state of formation for benzene, C6H6. And the other guys, uh, O2, CO2, and 3H2O, I am going to have to look them up. So you can look them up. Actually, if you go all the way down, I have the values here. So that's basically what I did to solve this problem. Products minus the reactants, we got to sum up the products. So very important that you multiply by the stoichiometric coefficient. So this is a problem. Many students forget to do this, and it leads to wrong answers. So when you do that, I look up CO2 gas, and I looked up water. I looked up, well, benzene is given to me. Oxygen is zero. So this is a point that I neglected to make. But the standard enthalpy state of formation for free elements is zero. Elements that are in their most naturally abundant state is zero. Remember, you need a reference point, final minus initial. And that reference point uh, under standard state is usually the element at its most naturally abundant state. So oxygen in its most naturally abundant state is O2, and it's a gas. So it's going to be zero. And um, we'll look at the table below and you'll get a better idea. But the most stable form of the element is the origin, and that origin is designated at zero. So as we continue on, I get these values from the back of my textbook. The units are kilojoules per mole. And as I continue to as I continue to compute the problem, I get an answer of minus three three one seven kilojoules per mole. One other issue that I want to mention is that this minus sign distributes. So it's going to be minus 2 times 49.04, minus 6 times 0. That minus sign distributes when you sum up the reactants. That minus sign just penetrates through that uh, uh, this uh, part of the equation. A lot of people misstep that algebra, particularly when it's been a long time. We haven't done algebra for many years. I'm not very much... Uh, attuned to that. Again, just uh, want to reiterate this are under standard state conditions. So the reaction is mine, uh, the reaction evolves minus 30 minus 3,317 kilojoules per mole of benzene. Now the reaction is endotherm now the reaction is exothermic because of the minus sign, but uh, this is per mole and it's for the reaction. Per mole of benzene, well, you have two moles of benzene, right? So this is the delta H for the entire reaction under standard state. Per mole of benzene is going to be minus 3317 divided by 2, which is about 1658 or so kilojoules per mole of benzene, C6H6. So coming back to the standard enthalpies of formation, again, standard state, 25 degrees C, one atmosphere of pressure. I want to point your attention to the zeros here. Silver as a solid, aluminum as a solid, bromine Br2 as a liquid, carbon as a graphite. We have seen already oxygen O2 is given zero. So these are the naturally abundant forms of these elements. Calcium is a solid is a zero. So not only is state important, but also uh, the most natural state, the no most naturally abundant state. In some cases, it could be a gas. And it could be diatomic, such as F2 gas, which is zero. 
which would mean F2 solid or F2 liquid will not be zero. Let's look at oxygen. So oxygen gas in the periodic table has this value. O2 gas is zero, again, natural abundance. And then we have O3 gas ozone, it's 142.2. So gases have one value, liquids have one value, solids have another value, but the reference point is zero. And that reference point, again, once again, has to do with the element or the compound in its most steady state, in its most natural abundance state. Now, none of that ever makes sense to you, you can just look this up in a table and just put zeros and plug it in back to that equation where we take the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants and plug in a zero. So this is a very good lookup table. We never memorize standard enthalpies of formation. Finally, we'll talk about Hess's law. So Hess's law means that we can add a reaction. And when we add a reaction, we add the corresponding enthalpies, delta H's. So here we have an equation. And a delta H, that not symbol, should tell you that it's under standard state. And it, that net equation has three sub-reactions. So what your job is to actually take these three equations and somehow get the top equation. And if you look really f further at this, you'll realize that um, C6H4OH2 is on the reactant side. H2O is on the reactant side. So these two guys are on the reactant side. C6H4O2 and water on the product side. C6H4O2 is on the product side here. Water is on the product side here. There's another water here. So if you add all of these three reactions together, you will get the net equation. And if you add all th three of these reactions, you also add the corresponding enthalpies. So the enthalpy of this reaction is minus 204 kilojoules per mole. How did we get that? We added three of the sub-reactions. So some final rules of Hess's law. If we multiply a reaction by two or three or 100, we must multiply the delta H or the delta H on standard enthalpy of formation by that number. If we reverse a reaction, we change the sign. So what was once exothermic becomes endothermic. What was once endothermic becomes exothermic.